Thank you so much for coming. My name is Pat Oker. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Science. Um, and it is my pleasure both to introduce and to be the interviewer for um, our guest this evening. Um, so we are here for the college's William Francis English Scholars in Residence program. And we want to give a very special welcome to the English family, several members of whom are here today. Kathy Manda, if you would just wave. Thank you so much. This is Dean English. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Dean English in a minute. Um, but Kathy is Dean English's granddaughter. And we also have two of his, I believe, two of his great granddaughters are here. Um, so I'm going to give a shout out to you, Abby Young. Abby, are you here? Thank you, Abby. Um, and Maddie Young. Thank you both for joining us. Um, Abby is a journalism student, and Maddie is a nursing student here at Mizzou. So 27 years ago, the English family very generously established this program in the College of Arts and Science, and they called it the William Francis English Scholars in Residence Program. William Francis English is a very important part of the history of our college. He earned a master's degree in political science with a minor in economics in 1931, then earned his PhD in history in 1943. I love the range there. He's a walking, talking arts and science person. And then joined the faculty as a history professor. Um, later in his career, he was named assistant dean, and then he served in the 1950s and 60s, he served as the associate dean and then dean of the college. And he really is one of the cornerstones of our college in our history. We are very, very grateful to the English family for dedicating this uh, resident, scholar in residence program in his honor. So this program was created to celebrate Dean English's relationship with arts and science. And what we do is we invite exemplary graduates who epitomize continued intellectual development and outstanding personal achievement to return and share their ideas and expertise. And today, it is my great pleasure to welcome back Howard Richards. Um, with, he has a career, many of you know, that has spanned the football field, the CIA, the Tigers broadcasting booth, and so much more. And Rich, Howard is definitely one of our overachieving alumni. He graduated with a degree in communication and is now the assistant athletic director with, in community relations. He's also a member of the advisory council for the Department of Communication and is a member of the college's strategic development board. Howard has received both an Arts and Science Distinguished Alumni Award and a, a, the University of Missouri's Faculty Alumni Award. He is here today for a conversation about his career. So welcome, Howard. Let's get Thank you ready. very much. So rather than give a formal lecture, what we decided this evening is we're going to uh, have a series of, in, of questions. I'm going to start and give uh, questions for about a half an hour. And then you will have a chance to ask Howard questions as well. So Howard, I want to start by thinking, uh, talking a little bit about your experience as a student here. Um, and since this is about arts and science, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you picked your major. Well, arts and science, first of all, thank you all for coming out tonight. I am pretty impressed. I, I was blown away when I saw how many people were here to come out to see little old me. <laughs> um, but this is impressive. And uh, uh, you guys can shame my daughter whenever she shows up. So she's, she's running a little late. She's left class, and she's in between. So anyway, um, I chose, I ended up in arts and science um, sort of accidentally. Uh, I started as a freshman in 1977. Of course, very few people in this room were born then. Uh, but I came to Mizzou as an engineering student. <clears throat> Spent the first year uh, trying to decide between either electrical or, or mechanical engineering. Uh, but I realized that, you know, at the time, we had 740 classes. And uh, as a freshman, trying to make that adjustment uh, to not just classes, you know, coming from high school to, to college, but also juggling football practice. And listen, I spent, this is before computers, you guys, or before personal computers. So we had an old engineering lab across from uh, uh, what's now University Towers. Um, can't even remember which building it was in, it's been so long ago. But I'd be in that lab till one, two in the morning, didn't have to get up. Uh, for these 740 classes. Needless to say, uh, after the first year, I decided that uh, I wanted more of a well-rounded college experience. So, I, you know, I thought I should probably look at a different major. I thought that I wanted to 
uh, be involved in special education, maybe teaching and helping um, kids with special needs. Um, but after spending a lot of time in there, I didn't have the heart for that. I mean, I, I was just too, I think, affected, too sensitive to um, a lot of the needs that uh, some of these special young boys and girls really needed. So I wanted to find something more mainstream. I had a talk with, uh, was it Dr. Cornwallis? Dr. Cornwallis, um, who was a professor in, in communication, in the, well, in the communication department in arts and science. And he told me that he felt that I probably would have uh, a good career in broadcasting if I decided to pursue that. I had done some public speaking, and uh, that's why he came to that conclusion. So that really encouraged me. And uh, I got to know him a little bit, and, and that's one thing that I, that I encourage my own, my daughter, Sydney, who will be here later, go and talk to your, your, uh, your instructors, you know, develop that relationship. Believe it or not, they're here because they want to be here. I mean, they are here because they are uh, so ingratiated in, in how successful that you guys want to be in school. I mean, they... It's a sacrifice. They're here because they want to be, not because they have to be. Uh, so if they are advising you to come in and talk to them, please do so. Um, so that's kind of how it got started for me. And, you know, had a chance to, uh, um, there's a guy in this room who came to Mizzou in 1979. And I was in his first class. And um, he has meant so much to me. Uh, our friendship and our professional relationship, but he has, he has mentored and guided me even to this day. So I have to give a big shout out to Dr. Michael Porter. Stand up, the, Dr. Porter. Yeah. Sherry Meritus of uh, the Department of Communication. And uh, this guy has done so much for this university and for students. And again, you know, he's, he's, he is probably... He and uh, Dean O'Brien and, of course, Pat in a different way, Pat Oker, um, have really been very responsible for my success here at Mizzou. So thank you very, very much. Um, and without you, I don't know that I'd, I'd even be sitting in this chair right now. So introduce your wife. Please stand up. Rose Porter. <laughs> she's, she's awesome, too. So, so that's, that's how um, I got here and just decided that, you know, the curriculum was really suited for me. And I thoroughly enjoyed all of the classes uh, that I took here. I enjoyed my instructors. Um, and it was, you know, I wish I had chosen, uh, chosen that career path much earlier. So you were a student athlete here. Um, and you talked to already about the the challenges of balancing academics with other things. Um, very few of our students are student athletes, but many of our students, maybe even most of our students, struggle with balancing things, whether it's family obligations, work obligations, school activities. Can you talk a little bit about how you learned how to balance things, about what your experience was as um, having to balance those different requirements because even though the circumstances might be very different, I think the principles probably remain the same for many students. How'd you learn how to do that? I learned that you really have to focus on priorities. And the biggest thing is why are we here? Why are you guys here? You're here to, you know, really develop your soon to be professional skills, uh, to earn a degree, and to be be prepared for uh, being adults, or we should say adulting. Uh, once you've left the university environment and joined the, the ranks of the real world. So that's your priority. And it's the same thing that I encourage when I talk to student athletes. You have a small window of time. Four years will go by very, very quickly, or whether it's three or whether it's five. It will fly by. And if you don't take advantage of what is before you, um, then you've wasted time, you've wasted money, you've wasted a lot. Um, and, and so again, focusing on your priorities is the key. And, and that's what I decided to do. Uh, I could 
party a lot if I wanted to, but I could really, and it, you know, I didn't do this in my first year. It took me about a year and a half to really get on track. Um, and, and that's when I decided that my priority uh, was not just being here to, to play football, but also to earn a degree and to make my, Make my family proud. There's my daughter, Sydney, and her roommate, Alyssa. Wave your hands, guys. Um, wonder where she gets her height from. <laughs> uh, so so I, I wanted to make my, my parents proud. Even though my folks did not have to pay for my education, um, I, I still treated it as though it was their money and not the university's money. So that is how and why I decided um, you know, and how I kept my focus and how I stayed on track. This is my priority. This is what I'm going to take care of first. Anything after that is gravy. If I want to have fun, I've got to take care of my schoolwork first. So one last question about your student experience, then we're going to go on and talk about different parts of your career. But was there any one particular class that really influenced you or um, proved especially useful down the road? Any class that really stood out in terms of the topic? Actually, other than Mike Porter's classes, uh, radio TV production, was actually a, a, a class taught by uh, Dr. Mary Jeanette Smythe called Nonverbal Communication. And my, as we'll get to later, my first year working for uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, my first career uh, assignment was as a background investigator working on investigating the folks that worked on uh, our contracts, CIA contracts. And of course they teach you a lot of skills uh, once you're interviewing um, individuals that are talking about a particular subject, but also when you're doing subject interviews, when you're interviewing the person who's being investigated, you know, there are different cues that you look for um, when you're talking to that person to, you know, outside of a polygraph or lie detector test, uh, you look for the things that they do with their eyes, with their hands, you know, their, their bodies. Uh, and I learned a lot of those skills in the nonverbal communication class. Don't know if they still teach it, but if they don't, I would highly, highly encourage any of you guys, if you can take it as an elective, uh, to take that class. It but it, was, it has served me well throughout life, even to this day. That's great. So um, after college, you went to um, the NFL. And so here's a question about the NFL that I'm guessing you don't get asked very often, but I'm curious about this. Is Did anything that you learn um, in as an arts and science graduate help you on the football field? Is there any relevance? Because, you know, mostly people are going to ask you about your athletic abilities there, which certainly that's what's important. But I'm curious, is there anything about what you learned as a student that helped you in a very successful career in the NFL? Actually, yes, just the, the ability to think critically. Uh, and you, you wanna say, how does that transfer into professional athletes? Well, the system that I played in at the Dallas Cowboys, I played for one of the, uh, probably one of the most famous coaches that ever coached in, in the National Football League, Tom Landry. Um, he was responsible for a lot of the innovations that you see offense, in offensive football today. Um, and his thing was, again, being prepared, taking care of your priorities, learning not just your position on the offense, but also learning what everyone else, the other 10 players on the offense had to do. Because the more you knew about that offense, um, the more successful you could probably be and the more successful any particular play would be. But also, as you prepare during the week, when you study an opponent, uh, you, as an individual, uh, outside of what you see on videotape and what you see in the computer printouts that we have, you've got to develop in your own mind what you have seen from that player's tendencies on videotape and how, to, how you're going to attack that particular person on game day. So there's one thing with what the coaches could uh, teach you, but as an individual, as a professional, uh, you owe it to yourself to sort of develop your own strategies beyond what, um, what a coach could tell you. And you've got to decide, hey, if I've got to put aside all my other personal things, if I, I may want to work extra after practice or come in um, on my off day and, and do work uh, or, or work before practice. 
just on technique and skill and then thinking and learning how to anticipate what that opponent was going to do or what that team was going to do in any given situations. I mean, for instance, you know, for those of you that are maybe not so football inclined, uh, when we would play a team like the Washington Redskins, who was our biggest rival, we would often have to prepare for as many as 15 different defenses on any defensive looks on any particular play. So in your mind, you've got three seconds uh, once you get up to the line of scrimmage to figure out what defense they are, what your assignment is, and if they change or move, you know, how will you adjust uh, to that situation, you know, to, to how they have moved or how they've changed their defense? And it's all split second. And you only get that from thinking critically, from, from preparing and from anticipation of what you see on videotape and what you see in your game plan um, and put it all together. And there's also a little bit of luck involved in that too. Um, but, but again, you know, learning how to think about uh, all the complexities of the game, then trying to simplify them. Uh, and and that, that skill set I developed right here on this campus. That's great. So one of the reasons that uh, we wanted to invite you um, to talk about your career is that we hear a lot now about changes in career is that the stu uh, gra somebody graduating from college right now is likely to have seven or eight different careers over their times. And people often uh, contrast that with you know, somebody who may be graduated, you know, in a, you know, previous decades who would have maybe had one or two careers. Well, you're quite young in this regard, I would say, Howard, because you've had a number of very different careers. So um, one of the things I want to talk about is these transitions. So uh, you are jump to the point where you're winding down your career in the NFL. Can you talk a little bit, was your first job out of the NFL, the CIA, did you go to Central Intelligence Agency directly there? So there, there are prospective students here who might be interested in a career there. Can you talk a little bit about how you did that or advice that you would share with them? If you're interested in that kind of career, what are some things that you can share with them that would be inspiring or helpful to students who might be interested in that kind of career? So I'll start by saying I, I never planned to be there, had no inkling that I would ever work for uh, the federal government or in civil service whatsoever. I fell into it um, after I had, well, first of all, let me just say this. I didn't graduate in four years because after uh, spending so much time in engineering and in the special ed, after my four years here, uh, I had enough numerical hours to graduate, but not enough in my area of concentration. So I left here with wasn't even sure at the time when I left how many hours I needed to graduate, but after I finished my career and spending, I spent a year at North Texas because I didn't know at the time if I wanted to, to return to Columbia. So I was actually thinking about graduating from the University of North Texas, which at the time was called North Texas State. Boy, are but we the, glad you didn't. Yeah, well, well, <laughs> and here's, here's the thing. So they did me a favor. Halfway through that semester, and I was actually killing it. I had a three, finished with a three eight that semester. One of my best semesters on campus. Um, halfway through that semester, I met with an advisor. And he broke the news to me that that university was not going to accept about 45 hours that I had earned on this campus. I said, are you, you mean to tell me that you, <laughs> are not going to accept credit hours from the oldest public university, accredited public university west of the Mississippi. And they said, nope, we're not. I said, well, I guess I won't be graduating from your institution. Immediately the next day, I called my old buddy, Mike Porter, broke down the situation to him. I said, tell me what I need to graduate. Um, he said, give me a day or two, I'll get back to you. Of course, he did that. He said, you need 20 hours. You can do it in a summer uh, and the fall semester, graduate in December, but you'll need also an internship. And I said, this was probably in March of 1988. I said, I'll see you in June. And uh, so I did my Beverly Hillbillies Act. I packed up the truck and, and came back, enrolled in school, and uh, did an internship at uh, Channel 13 up in Jefferson City. Three days a week, I was able to sort of, you know, because of another colleague, Jim Reek, 
you guys maybe see on the Channel 8 News, well, he worked in sports at the time at Channel 13. He gave me that opportunity. And uh, I did some amazing things there. I mean, I did, I shot video of the Mizzou football games. I'd come back, run back to the station, edit it. The next day on Sunday, we would, uh, he allowed me to be on camera. So I talked about, uh, I previewed the NFL games and reviewed the Mizzou football game the day before. Uh, and on Mondays, I previewed the Monday night football game. But during the week, I edited um, all the, the raw footage uh, that the videographers would go out and shoot uh, for the news segment. So it wasn't just sports that I was doing. I was doing you know, features and, and hard news as well, too. Um, so that, that is, is how I ended up doing what I did. Anyway, long story short, after I graduated, moved back to Dallas. And one Sunday, March of 89, looking through the the Dallas Morning News, uh, because I had been sending out resumes and tapes and, and wasn't getting the types of responses that I wanted to get. You know, as professional football players, I will say this, you know, there's, there's a little bit of ego involved. We all think that we should get maybe some things that we're not necessarily entitled to, uh, but you kind of develop that skill set as a player. You know, you've, you've got to be tough and you've got to have this sort of macho image when you're on the field. Well, sometimes it carries over off the field. Anyway, um, I wasn't getting the type of responses uh, that I felt that I should. So I thought that when I saw this ad, um, and at the bottom of this is a full page ad, at the bottom of the ad there were areas of employment that uh, interested me, and one was communications. So I applied. I thought, well, you know, this might be an opportunity. I could get there and, and maybe work in corporate communications, if you will, and, and that may lead to something, uh, you know, more substantial. I also felt that uh, I may have been uh, stereotyped by some employers. Uh, big football player, you know, did, did the guy really go to class? Um, so I felt that if, if, if I could be hired by the CIA, that it would put more meat on my resume and people would start to take me more seriously. So I think it actually worked in my favor by doing so. I thought I would stay for two or three years go back to grad school because I had also uh, interviewed with Anheuser-Busch and they recommended a program at Ohio University, a graduate program for sports marketing and administration, which is really considered to be the best program still to this day. Um, so I, I, I took the GRE, uh, they didn't hire me at that time. So I took the GRE, um, applied to this program and, and got accepted. It was pretty cool because I only took 25 students a year. But I got my offer of employment from the agency the same uh, time that I was accepted to go to grad school there. And I was married at the time. I decided that uh, we'd been living off of my NFL savings. I figured I needed to work because she was in school at the time, too. It's, she was in medical school. So I, I postponed grad school and decided to go to work for the agency. Didn't leave after two or three years. Stayed 13 years. And the rest is history. So that's how I ended up. Um, there. So from there, um, my, my goodness, I mean, it, it was a tremendous career for me. So in addition to uh, being an investigator, uh, my second assignment was on the personal protection staff for uh, the CIA director. So I worked, I did that for eight years, working for four different CIA directors. Um, and their deputies. And some of those, if you guys are up to date on, on, on political news, you've probably heard the name uh, John Brennan. Well, John Brennan was the chief of staff to one of the directors, George Tenet. Uh, so John is, is, is a good friend. And uh, also Mike Morrell is another name that you may have seen in the political news leading up to the 2016 election, and even post the election with all the, the craziness that's going on in our, uh, in our uh, government today. Uh, but those, those are people that I worked intimately with uh, on a regular basis. And uh, it was just a great experience. Um, took me to five continents, uh, somewhere between 45 and 50 countries in the world. Had a chance to uh, live in the Middle East, um, in Tel Aviv, where uh, Sydney spent you know, two of her formative years. She has no recollection of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was a great experience. Most of my time has been spent in the Middle East. Uh, from there, I also came back, or oh, in between tours, I split my 
protective assignments. And uh, I also worked on um, uh, some policy with the community, intelligence community management staff where we did personnel and uh, security standards, among other things, working with some of the co congressional staffers on the uh, uh, intelligence committees for both the Senate and the House of Representatives. Uh, then came back and, and did um, clearance adjudications. So I, I actually had the responsibility of deciding who would uh, be granted a clearance as an applicant or for those that were already um, held clearances uh, through the reinvestigation process, whether they keep their clearances or if those clearances were revoked. So that was my, in a nutshell, that's what I did at, uh, at CIA. Then I uh, decided that I wanted to do something different, wanted to work for myself. Uh, became a, a, a realtor in Washington, D.C., in Northern Virginia, and, and, and did pretty well financially there during the big bubble. And when that burst, uh, decided that um, probably needed to do something else, too, in addition to, uh, still, I, I love real estate. I mean, it's always been something that I've been passionate about. But one of my old bosses at the agency started his own security company. When George Tenet left um, the agency, he went to work for a company in New York called Allen and Company. It's an investment banking firm for the, the mega rich. Anyway, uh, he, along with uh, uh, several other high net worth individuals, would travel the world. And so we would do probably eight or nine trips uh, a year, supporting uh, them in the overseas environment. Uh, so from there, uh, I decided that I, I was done with security, uh, at least you know traveling and all that. Moved back to St. Louis to kind of help out family, uh, my mom specifically. My stepfather needed some, you know, he, his health was failing, so I moved back to help her. He eventually passed away, but uh, I got an offer to work as the director of security for Harris Stowe State University in St. Louis. Was there for four years before uh, coming to work in 2015 for the University of Missouri. Uh, Dean Oker's predecessor, Dean Michael Bryan. And, um, about a year and a half later, had an opportunity to transition into uh, Mizzou Athletics, which is something that I've always had an interest in doing as well, too. Um, Dean Oker was very gracious to allow me to kind of pursue something that I wanted to do. And, but even after leaving Arts and Science, my heart never really left Arts and Science. So I've stayed very active with the college, and uh, it's near and dear to, to me. So you can so can you tell us a little bit about the job that you have now? I we're gonna I just want to make sure we get a chance to talk about your experience as a broadcaster. But talk about the work that you do in community relations for athletics. What's challenging? What do you like about it? Um, uh, and I guess I, the point of my question really is my guess is it's not like it was a plan. Like I'm gonna be in community relations when I grow up, right? None of this is a plan but it's a job that really suits you. I see you in this job and the amazing things that you do. And I love the way that that unfolds in ways that people don't always predict. So if you could describe a little bit about what you like about your current job in athletics. I, it's, it's really pretty broad. And, and just, I guess, so that we can save time here. Yeah, because we, um, we got some sports writers here. I know yeah, we gotta talk about sports. I, um, as you know, I, when I came to work for uh, Arts and Science, the dean had, Dean O'Brien, had a, a position in mind for me. Uh, and he wanted to build better connections in the St. Louis community. Um, when you think about there are 30,000 plus students on this campus, roughly a third of you all come from the St. Louis area. So he felt it very important to have that presence. You know, why would you not? when when you know, most of the alumni in St. Louis, um, you know, went to school here. So he felt that if you could connect um, the alumni base in St. Louis with faculty here on campus, with students, um, that you could generate more, I'd say, enthusiasm, uh, possibly develop uh, uh, additional donors, uh, especially during the times that the, the, the state legislature was funding higher education at a much, much lower level. So we needed to find different uh, ways to sort of fund what we're doing here. This is before all the cuts happened 
uh, on campus recently. But that's how I was working in St. Louis. When Jim Sterk became athletic director um, about two years ago, he, unbeknownst to me, talked with um, a lot of people both here on campus and in St. Louis. Um, and the next thing I know, I got an offer to go to work with athletics. He was familiar with the role that I was doing with ANS there, but wanted to, um, I think, develop that role and expand it. So that's how I basically got to continue to do um, what I was doing, but uh, athletics-based. So uh, even though I'm, I'm, I'm an athletic director, assistant AD, I'm not really involved directly with student athletes on a direct basis. Um, I am still doing a lot of those, those connection type events with, with alumni, with uh, trying to develop some prospective donors. Um, I'm sort of a liaison from the St. Louis community when, when people have an issue and you know, they don't want to drive to Columbia or they can't get the person that they want to on the phone, I'm, I'm there uh, to, to be a listening ear and to basically bring back those issues or concerns or suggestions to the athletic director, to the athletic department. Um, we've also had um, two other projects that I've worked on, or, and actually we're still working on. One, the Mizzou Youth Experience, which some of you may or may not know, but we have, um, athletics took the lead, but this is really a campus initiative to uh, really get into the middle schools, because this is where it's really the, the best time to sort of to enable these young boys and girls to start thinking about college. If you've gotten to high school and haven't really thought much about it, it's too late. And so uh, last year was the inaugural year of the youth experience where we brought kids to campus. They had a tour and ended it up with a football game. This year we did the same thing but added uh, an academic piece to it. So we developed these learn tracks where these youngsters could come on campus for some experiential learning and the College of Arts and Science participated, journalism, uh, I think engineering, and, and many, many others. Uh, got a big shout out to Dean Ted Tarko also. Raise, raise, your, raise your hand, Dean Tarko. Yes, who, who was influential along with Dean Oker with getting arts and science involved in this. And listen, these youngsters uh, have, have really been impacted uh, by the experience, to be on campus and to get a taste of what you all are studying right now um, really gets them thinking much, much earlier about not just going to college, but maybe going to college here at Mizzou. Uh, and also in, including the families and their parents in this thing too, that's how you get them. Uh, and if you continue to touch them uh, over and over again, the chances that they'll end up in college are good. Uh, but there are also the chances that they end up in college here at Mizzou are, are really good as well, too. So that and another project where we've kind of looked at some of the historical racial issues that have plagued the university um, uh, and the campus. Uh, we've made some really good progress in that area. It's still a process that's ongoing, uh, but getting great suggestions from, from a lot of the uh, people, some alumni, some not, but have a really good observation point of what's happening in that 120 mile uh, gap between St. Louis and Columbia. So these are things to me with the outreach now that the university is, is doing in the St. Louis area and really all over the state um, and, and going outside of just athletics has really given me a, a lot of great satisfaction uh, to be able to you know, see the faces of these youngsters who uh, really appreciate not just the youngsters, but also their parents um, and the educators, you know, the principals, the counselors, the superintendents. They want to do this and are already talking about next year's event. Thank you so much. So uh, two more questions I have, and then we'll open up to the floor. Um, one is, t uh, tell us a little bit about your experience as a broadcaster. Um, it looks like a glamorous job in many ways to many people. Is it as glamorous as it, is, as it appears to us as we're listening to you? If, if it paid more, it'd be really glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it is a lot of fun. As Mizzou's color analyst on the radio broadcasts, just completed my eighth year. In fact, uh, the Arkansas game was my 100th broadcast. Congratulations. Thank you. That's great. 
Of course, my broadcast partner, Mike Kelly, has done 300 plus <laughs> now. Uh, but, you know, I think 100 is, is pretty cool. That's it, and it, a good listen, round number. It flew by. I can't believe that I've already got eight years under my belt. Uh, but it's for me, it's, it's a great experience because all I get to do is talk about football. But I, I'm talking to an audience that is not watching the game on television. So I become your eyes and ears. I have to, in a flash, you know, describe why a play worked or, or why it didn't work and what we might be able to anticipate, you know, on the next play or the next series of downs. So the play-by-play -play announcer gives you the who, what, when, and where, and I give you the how and why. Um, so it's been, it is, to me, it's like the easiest job in the world in some ways. The preparation, I spend probably four to five hours, hours uh, during the week in addition to my regular job uh, preparing for uh, the upcoming game. And I do that by perusing, you know, if we were playing Arkansas, by, by reading the newspapers in Fayetteville and Little Rock. I read some of the national things that have been written about that, um, that particular uh, team. Uh, I also will do radio interviews with uh, their newspaper beat writers, their sports writers in that particular city. Um, so I, I feel very connected. I also watched a ton of video during the week, uh, three or four games from that opponent's previous three or four games, to really get a feel for what it takes to, to produce and bring to you all, the listener, the best product on Saturdays when we play. Uh, do you imagine an audience... Do you have an audience in your mind of who, what, who they are and what they're doing? I do, it, it, and it's, it's more than just uh, a statewide audience now with sa uh, satellite radio. It's a national audience. It's now an international audience because we have listeners that listen outside of the United States too. Um, but in some ways, you know, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm talking to just a few people, but, and I don't think about, you know, how many people are actually listening but I know our reach is very broad. Um, and, and I take great pride in, in what I do and, and try to be very critical of what I do. Um, and I think I'm doing okay because the feedback that I get from Robin Winokur uh, mm -hmm. and others, uh, my good friend Robin, uh, and others has been really positive. And, you know, when someone says that, that they appreciate uh, the product that you put out on Saturdays, that's all I need. Do you ever listen to yourself? Do you listen, you know, like watch your own, uh, the equivalent of watching your own tapes? I do listen on occasion, not to every game. Um, I do, during the season, I also do three different uh, radio segments uh, on our flagship station in St. Louis. So I will do on Sundays a, a live hit with uh, our flagship station to review the day's game before. Uh, on Wednesdays, I will record for the upcoming preview show, which will air on Friday nights. Um, and then on Friday mornings before game, uh, I, I do a live segment with uh, uh, McGraw-Millhaven in St. Louis. So I, I, I stay very busy. Um, but it, again, for me, because you prepare for it, um, it just becomes like second nature. And, uh, no, but I'm also having fun at it. Whatever you do, make sure you're having fun. I wasn't really having that, mu that much fun as an engineering student, so I, <laughs> I found something that made sense to me and uh, something that I could have fun doing. One last topic, if you could just touch briefly and then we'll open it up. Um, I've heard you talk before about what, what you have looked for when you're hiring people or what you believe other, like when you talk to other people who are hiring. And I was wondering, we have many students here, um, what do you think employers are looking for? What are you looking for when you're in a situation of hiring somebody that may be fresh out of college? So I have worked as a manager before at Harristow. Uh, I managed a group of 20, uh, 22 uh, officers. Uh, I did manage a team during protective operations when I was at the, at the agency. And the thing that I looked for mostly was someone that was passionate about what they were doing. Uh, I didn't want someone that was just going to be going through the motions or someone that was there just to collect a paycheck. Uh, someone that wants to contribute, someone that has really a vested interest in this particular job. And people with initiative. Um, someone that's not afraid to ask questions, no matter if you, th you think it's a dumb question. Um, but that, that constant communication between um, employee and manager, I think is very important. 
Because there are things as a manager that you may not be aware of on a daily basis uh, that you can bring to your manager. And that, to me, that encourages um, that, that open flow of regular communication. So don't be afraid, don't be intimidated. Again, you know, talking to your instructors. If you're working summer jobs or have internships, be inquisitive, ask those questions. You know, show up early, uh, make the coffee, bring the donuts. Just any little thing that you can do to um, make it hard for them to tell you no. Uh, and I think that's the biggest thing outside of learning to build relationships and start that process right now while you're here. You never know if this dean or this former chair here or any other instructors or anyone else that's in this room uh, may be able to help you down the road. And you know, if, if you're respectful and, and treat them very, very well and ask questions, uh, I think it does benefit you later on. I'm always impressed by students that come up to me that have either, either heard of me or just you know, want to know uh, of, about what I've done and how I got there. And so I just tell them. But I think it's, I love the fact that they come to me and ask me those questions uh, because I think it helps you all going forward. You know, how do you, how do you make those approaches? How do you not be intimidated? And, and again, but building those relationships now, asking your parents, asking your friends, because uh, it's not just about who you know, but it's about who knows you. Uh, and that's very, very important. On the topic of asking questions, we have a mic up here. So I'd like to open it up to anybody from the floor who would like to ask Howard a question. So just stand up and uh, if you would talk into the mic, that'd be great. So go ahead. Hi, my name is Rachel. Hi, and Rachel. I am new to Mizzou and everything. And being a student is such a growing process. And so I was curious if knowing what you know now and having done so much in the workforce, if you could go back to your college self and give yourself a piece of advice, what would it be? Good question. Good, great question. Um, probably apply myself a little more. Um, my grades are okay, um, but I think even as busy as I was, uh, I could have probably done better. And I, Part of it was, you know, playing football here and, and juggling so much. Uh, I, I tried to, well, I didn't try to procrastinate, but I did procrastinate a little bit. And, you know, I was fortunate enough. I, I, I went to gifted schools when I was younger. So I, it, it was a part of me that knew that I could kind of wait to the last minute to do stuff. But, you know, why put yourself through all that stress, you know, when you can spend more time preparing during the week? Um, not that I was lazy. Um, but I was probably... I don't think anybody would call you Lexi <laughs> Howard. I'm just um, guessing. I, I, I could always find something to distract me. So, again, I, I could have done a better job of prioritizing and managing my time. Uh, that's really the only thing that I would change. As a, so as a young student, I think those are the things I think if you handle those, you're on your way. And you go to class, you're on your way. You will be successful. Great. Thank you. Thank you. How you doing, Mario Smith? Hey, uh, Mario. I see that you are a good brother of Kappa Alpha Psi, so I wanted Indeed. to know how did the bond <laughs> help you, uh, you know, along your way? Relationships. Uh, relationships. Ironically, I didn't pledge when I was on campus. I pledged in the graduate chapter, chapter of St. Louis. <clears throat> but it was so funny because so many uh, of the brothers in the fraternity <clears throat> were students here on campus. Mm -hmm. So I had to go away from St. Louis and Missouri for 30 years to come back and see the same people. Uh, but they welcomed me, um, and, and they thought it would be a good fit. And after you know examine, examining it for a while, I thought it would be a good fit as well, too. And uh, uh, it, it is, it's, it's been a tremendous experience uh, to, to uh, I think, re, rekindle a lot of those relationships that uh, I had thought I had lost you know, years ago. Uh, but it's one of the best decisions I've made in my life. Yeah. <laughs> Form a line. Here comes another one. No. Sorry. You're it's okay. Totally fine. Hi, um, my name's Mercedes Sapp, and I'm a former student athlete. I play, I play soccer, and I just had a question. Um, with being an impact player, what is your advice for fellow student athletes on how to impact your season and your teammates? 
Um, sorry, just the last part of that again, please. Just how, like, what are ways that you've learned to help impact your teammates in your season? Communication. You know, I think the biggest thing is is developing those relationships and developing that trust. Like in football, the guy next to you and the guys behind you and with that quarterback. Always talking about scenarios, if you will. Um, and, and it's – it's more than just teamwork. Again, it trust is a is a big thing in especially team sports, um, which will serve you very well as a professional in later life. Uh, and again, I, I, you, you hear this term, just building those relationships. My goodness, I, I cannot overemphasize or emphasize enough how important that is uh, because they will serve you well down the road. Awesome. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, my name is Erica Winston. Hi, Erica. Yes, um, I am interested in working in with in intelligence, and I just wanted to know, um, at what point did you know you were ready to make that leap? Um, once they started started showing interest in me, in me after I applied, uh, I went in for an initial interview, and uh, the the interviewers were interviewing me to be a case officer. Um, so if you're not familiar with what the role of a case officer is, uh, a case officer essentially recruits uh, those from foreign governments to spy for the United mm -hmm. States. Um, and in that role, there are a lot of things that uh, you have to do that may be deemed by some as unscrupulous, you know, which is why people have security clearances. There are a lot of things that, uh, that are done uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that um, those in the intelligence community can't really share. Um, but it is very exciting. I mean, it's, it's, it's thrilling work. And, you know, I, I can't, the people that work in intelligence, uh, to me, have probably the, the, one of the most thankful lines of work um, anywhere. Because much of what they do is so important to the freedom of this world, uh, but much of it goes unheralded. Uh, no one can really know what they do. And that's sometimes hard for, for people that, you know, really should be recognized, but really can't because you know, most of the times they're working undercover. Uh, but it, it, the best way to get into it, I mean, if you go to uh, CIA.gov, their website, if you haven't already, um, you can apply. And uh, I'd say outside of just the application process, uh, if you can find someone that has some connections on the inside, that always helps to get in those relationships. Um, what you can do to prepare now is, listen, be really good with your finances um, because once you're interviewed, they do credit checks, and, and that's one of the biggest uh, disqualifiers is for those that are not financially responsible because it makes you more susceptible to blackmail. Um, everything else, um, you got to be a good citizen, if you will. Um, you, you can't have a, a past criminal background. Oh, I say. You certainly can't have any felonies. Um, those that, that do the hiring there, they understand that we're all young people. You do some things on campus you may not be proud of, but is, if they look at your, your whole person. They look at you know, the things that you've done to sort of counter that maybe the few bad things that you've done. So they take all of that into, into consideration. So if, you've, if, you've, uh, if you're considering a career in intelligence, Straighten up and fly right. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, hello, I'm Darnell Dow. I'm a broadcast journalism uh, major. Fantastic. And I wanted to ask, um, if you could say there was one thing that would set you apart from the crowd as a broadcaster, what would it be? My experience. My experience um, as a professional football player gives me instant credibility. But it's not just that, because there are a lot of, a lot of people that, could, that have that experience, too. Um, but I think preparing, uh, preparing to, again, put out the best possible broadcast that I possibly can. You know, studying the things that I'm going to be talking about, doing research, uh, 
I know some people just kind of show up and, and, and can get in front of a microphone and be really good, but uh, you've got to do the little things. I mean, I, I was taught once by an instructor at North Texas, a guy named Bill Mercer, who was a, broad, a famous broadcaster. And he said, you know, when you're reading script that comes off of the wire services, don't just come in, tear it, and read it, because there are a lot of things that, you know, when you read it, don't sound like you being conversational to your audience. So sometimes you've got you've to look at what's written on paper and maybe change some of the grammar or change the way the, uh, you know, something uh, may not be phonetically written. So you've got to do it in a way that suits you and read it and reread it and reread it. So when time comes and you're ready to go behind that microphone, you sound as natural as possible. Again, preparation. Preparation and knowing your subject matter is, is the best thing. So when you go in for interviews, try to do research on the company um, that is going to be talking to you because I think they will be impressed, further impressed with um, the time that you spent learning about their organization. Thank you. Sure. Hi, my name is Jamila Kuhn, and uh, I wanted to ask, what skills did you learn on the field? Because, you know, as a student athlete, you know, you, got, you learn certain skills. What helps you and set you apart in life, like getting jobs and like going to the NFL and being a CIA agent and everything like that? I think toughness. Um, not letting an obstacle deter me. Um, I was challenged by a lot of things. Uh, even when I went to the agency, um, I think there were people there that didn't want me to be there. They made assumptions that because I was a professional athlete that, um, that I would probably just have things given to me. Uh, but I made it very clear that when I got into the organization that I wanted to be treated just like everyone else. I wanted to be evaluated on my own merits um, and, and not on my name or my past experience uh, outside of that agency. So everything that I got, every assignment, every promotion that I got, I earned it. I earned it. And it was really through uh, being a football player, you know, the toughness, the discipline, uh, going to practice, doing the things in hot weather, cold weather, that uh, many people will walk away from. Uh, it, it becomes part of your, your fabric. And um, you know, doing the things that other people don't want to do, I think, are the things that kind of set you apart. And that's why people look at athletes as being, um, in some ways, more desirable uh, because of uh, the discipline and your work ethic. Uh, so if you don't have to be an athlete, um, but you can develop those same sets of skills uh, again, by going the extra mile and doing those things that we talked about, you know, proving that you're worthy. And again, make it so that they can't tell you no. Right. Hope that answered your question. Thank you. Sure. Hey, my name is Ezra. I got this question. It says, um, well, you said it's not just about who you know, but who knows you. Um, had you not been a successful collegiate athlete and made it to the National Football League afterwards, would you have still had such great relationships and maintained them after having left Mizzou? Um, and if not, how would you suggest that the everyday unknown college student could create and maintain such relationships beyond graduation? It was a mouthful. <laughs> um, again, I think taking the time to, to learn about people, to talk to people, and communication and this is why communication degrees are so valuable. Uh, whether you, you might even be uh, an engineer, but you know, engineering firms need people with great communication skills you know, for their technical writers that don't have great communication skills, skills. And you don't have to major in communications to learn how to be a good communicator. But it's about talking, but it's also about listening and trying to absorb as much information as you can. But then try to translate that and, and, and speak to people, to others, in simple terms. You don't, you don't have to have a lot of flowery or, or, or complicated language. The biggest thing is trying to relay, trans, transfer the points that you're trying to make to a point, to, in a way that people can understand it. And as a broadcaster, that's what I try to do. I, I don't try to complicate it. I try to use language that the layperson will understand. Because, you know, describing football 
uh, nomenclature and terminologies, you know, would just confuse people if that's, I use those terms all the time. And even if I do, I try to break it down and explain it uh, so that a person maybe that has, you know, a housewife who has no interest other than, you know, listening to the game because they may have been an alum or, you know, their family members may have gone to the university, something that I can relate to that person that's listening. And uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but I learned by listening to other broadcasters. You know, I still do that today. When I'm driving back to St. Louis after our games, I'll turn on other games and still listen, trying to constantly improve upon what I can do. A perfect way to end the event is a question from Dean English's granddaughter. Wow. So I'm no longer a student, and I didn't want to take the student's time, but I have a comment and a question. My comment is, you made a statement that you thought that you were broadcasting to people who were not watching the game, and there are many of us oh, that watch the game, turn down the sound, and listen to you. <laughs> I'd much rather watch the game that way. And I do listen when I'm not watching, but I almost never <laughs> listen to what's on the television because I'd rather hear you all. It's, it's much you. more enjoyable. So, so remember, there are some of us that are watching. <laughs> That's my comment. My question is, on, sat on Saturday, there was a lot of conversation in the booth about your sweet potato pie. <laughs> yeah. So she I'm interested in um, whether or not you made the sweet potato pie, or is that your wife or your mother, or a recipe that's been handed down, or did you buy it? <laughs> Didn't buy it. Sydney, are you still here? Or she leave already? She's gone. She had to go. I made it. Awesome. And it's, it's a, I won't even say it's a recipe. It's just a skill that I learned from watching uh, you know, my mother, my grandmother, uh, my aunts and cousins make it. So I tried to take all the things that they did and, and improve upon it. For instance, many people that will make sweet potato pies boil their potatoes. I don't do that. I roast mine because when you roast it, you sort of contain all those great sugars in the sweet potato. So they make for a more flavorable Dessert. So do you roast it in the in the skin? In the jacket, yes, I do. Okay. I, I don't peel, but it makes it much easier to peel after they're cooked inside, yes. Okay, so what are your other secrets? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you don't want to share. With, with regard to sweet, <laughs> potato, sweet potato pie. Any other sweet potato pie secrets? Um, lots of butter. <laughs> I, I try to bring use everything at room temperature beforehand. Um, and I... I do everything by taste. Sometimes you may not have the best sweet potatoes, so you may have to amend it with maybe a little more sugar or a little more ginger, or I use you know, nutmeg, I use cinnamon, and then I'll use some other spices as well too. I actually like how they package uh, both apple pie spice and pumpkin pie spice, so I use those as well, uh, and a little bit of ginger. And if I have a little bit of uh, orange juice in my refrigerator, I add some orange juice too for, for flavoring. I try to use the natural uh, vanilla flavoring though instead of, uh, instead of the imitation. And let me just say, you cannot get advice like this anywhere. It's right here in the College of Arts and Science. Please join, Howard, you were a man of many talents, and now I get to add some more about sweet potato pie. Um, please, everyone join me in thanking Howard for joining us this evening. And, and thank you all for coming out. We'll be having another Scholars in Residence next semester, so I hope you join us for that as well. Thank you.